Aren't we all beautiful? How are we doing today? Doing all right. How are you doing? I think I'm going to make it. Not worse, that's it. <laughs> Sounds good. There we go. I'll be back in this minute. Oh, it is? Yeah, which way do you want? Uh, I think I went the other way. <laughs> When you want to start, you just hit the. There we go. There we go. Yeah. I'm going to want to see what. Am I, why do I look at me? Why do I look at him? <laughs> <laughs> we We're not ready to start yet, are we? Yep. <laughs> Where are we? Yes, Ed. We're downstairs. Yeah. Yeah, we're ready to start. We're ready to start. Yes. Yeah, yeah, give me two seconds. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, I have returned. Happy Father's Day, Ken. Happy Father's Day to you all. Nice to be with you this morning. If you hear any extraneous noises in the background, it is evidence of fatherhood. I am at John. I am at John's house. He's got three little kids running around. So I'm set up in his office because of the fact that uh, my internet stinks. <laughs> there you have it. So anyhow, well, what do you say we uh, start off by reading the scripture here this morning? We're Second Peter chapter three, uh, beginning at verse ten. And I'll be reading from the unauthorized King James Version, which is the Ken Barkley paraphrase of King James. So, uh, uh, here we go. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are in it, will be burned up. Seeing then that all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons should you be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens, being on fire, will be dissolved, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, will we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwells righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace, without spot, and blameless. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you, as in all his epistles, speaking of these things, in which are some things that are hard to be understood which they that are unlearned and unstable do twist as they do also the other scriptures, oh. and that to their own destruction. Therefore, beloved, seeing that you know these things beforehand, beware lest you also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now <laughs> and forever. Amen. Well, it's nice to be with you again. This is the first opportunity I've had to preach since leaving and moving out here. So I'm hoping it's a little bit like the old adage, it's like riding a bicycle. You never really forget how to do it. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We pray your blessing on our time together here this morning and pray that uh, the words that we speak might be edifying to your people and instructing to our hearts and that we might be filled once again with the awe and wonder of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, let me summarize in just a few sentences what Peter's getting at. First, there are some earth-shaking changes that are coming, literally. God is going to do away violently with his first creation as we now know it. And secondly, things are going to get way better after that with God's new creation. He's going to do a redo with righteousness as the centerpiece of this whole new world. Won't that be novel? He's going to... Uh, create the world all over again. And since that is the case, Peter is saying it's imperative that we order our lives according to God's word, understanding that there are many who will try to turn us away from following the Lord mm -hmm. after their own foolish example. But instead of following their destructive example, Peter is saying, do this instead. And here's where we're going to camp out this morning grow in grace um, and in the knowledge of our Lord. And I have no problem concluding that those two things go hand in hand, growing in grace and growing in the knowledge of our Lord. But I'm going to focus this morning on the first part, growing in grace. So to start with, let's get really, really basic. We talk about growing in grace 
what does it mean to grow? Period. What does it mean to grow? We throw that word around a lot. We talk about growing in the Lord. Uh, we hear the question in church circles, are you growing in your walk with the Lord? Is there any way to quantify that? Or is it just an abstract, subjective, kind of means whatever you want it to mean thing? Well, to start with, growth takes for granted that you are alive spiritually. Dead things don't grow. Growing spiritually implies that you have passed from death to life through faith in Jesus Christ, and that by the indwelling, life-giving activity of the Spirit of God. As Paul wrote in Romans 8.10, if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life or is alive because of righteousness. So are you on board with this prerequisite for growth? Have you finally decided to have done with sin and received Christ by faith? Does growing mean doing more Christian things? Does it mean taking a new position or taking on more responsibilities in the church? Does it mean reading more Christian books? Does it mean attending more Christian events, seminars, meetings, concerts, whatever? There are any number of things that we can either consciously or unconsciously substitute for real spiritual progress. So let me ask you this. Are you growing in the spiritual sense of the word? If you look at a plan from day to day or week to week, how would you know if it was growing? Wouldn't a key indicator be that its form had changed in some particular way? Maybe it got bigger. Maybe its color was more enhanced. Maybe it grew some flowers, or perhaps it could have produced some fruit. Whatever the case, I think we can safely conclude that a key element of growth is change. If something hasn't changed, it hasn't grown. When we're talking about growth in the Christian life, we're talking about positive spiritual change. So if we accept the premise that growth of necessity requires us to change, perhaps another or maybe a better way to ask if you are growing is to put it like this. What has changed recently for the better in your Christian experience? Or even more exactly, what has changed recently in your life because of a direct response of obedience to God's word? Where have you said, yes, God, I'm willing to make that change because I know you want me to? And that kind of question takes the matter of growth out of the subjective arena and moves away from the, these more or less nebulous considerations of what it means to grow spiritually. Realistically speaking, if nothing is changing, you're not growing. So it's fair to ask, do we substitute doing Christian things or activities for genuine movement toward the likeness of Christ in our life? So where are we at here? Number one, life is a prerequisite for growth, and growth requires change. Peter says we're to grow in grace. So what does he mean by that? How do we do it? Well, there's a number of different ways that the Bible talks about grace. So there are different ways that we can grow in grace according to the different applications of the meaning of grace that we find in Scripture. Y'all with me out there? Yes. Okay. It's kind of weird preaching to a computer. <laughs> <laughs> and sitting down. I've never preached sitting down before. That's kind of different. So, 
I think we could say that the baseline we have in our biblical understanding of grace is that familiar meaning we find in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you're saved through faith. And that's not because of your own effort. It's the gift of God. It's not by works, lest anyone should brag. And in this basic sense, grace is the act of God's benevolence, whereby on condition of faith, he gifts to us access to forgiveness, acceptance by God, and every blessing that's associated with salvation. We can't be good enough for God to accept us, so he gives us this undeserved acceptance because we repent of our sin and believe God's account of his own son's death and resurrection on our behalf. I'm not telling you anything new here. So, if you're a beneficiary of that grace, there's no real sense in which you can grow in that grace so as to be more or less saved. You're either saved or you're not by grace. But you can grow and you can be impacted by your spiritual apprehension and your internalization of the reality of exactly how powerful and how enormous that grace of God really is. We're saved by grace. You can't be more saved. You can't be less saved. But you can grow in your comprehension and you can grow in your grasp of the magnitude of God's love saving grace and an increase in your comprehension of God's saving grace will do a number of things for you it will enable you to lay down your pride that's real change that's growing it will keep you from becoming too judgmental of other sinners yeah that might be growing too for some of us it will compel you to constantly Turn away from and reject spiritual arrogance, that I'm better than you are kind of attitude. It will be your constant reminder that every good thing you have or any worthy attribute, gift, or special ability you may possess, you owe entirely to God's grace. 1 Corinthians 4.7 from the Good News Translation reads like this. Who made you superior to others? Didn't God give you everything you have? Well then, how can you boast as if what you have was not a gift? Or as the authorized version reads, what do you have that you've not received? And when you begin to grasp an expanded view of God's grace, after you chew on it for a while, You'll find the fact of how much you owe to God's grace beginning to affect how you think and how you act. And that's how we get all the flavor out of something, isn't it? We chew on it. <laughs> Perhaps that's another metaphor for meditating. In Colossians 1.6, talking about the gospel, Paul writes this. It is come unto you as it is in all the world, and it brings forth fruit, just like it does in you, since the day you heard it and knew the grace of God in truth. Your comprehension of God's grace has a direct correlation to bearing spiritual fruit. It's especially true in our coming to Christ when we really grasp the, the, the whole dimension of God's grace. But I believe the principle applies even afterward as well. Truly comprehending God's grace yields to fruitfulness. <laughs> now I'm going to ask a question. Have any of you ever looked through a variable power rifle scope? I don't know how many hunters we have out there. But there's a, there's a ring on it that you twist to increase the power of the scope. Like my deer rifle has a three to nine power scope. And if you put it on three power, uh, you see you see the bigger picture. But as you twist it up to nine power, you get a closer look at things, and the object that you're looking at appears to get closer. 
And though that object doesn't actually get any bigger, your view of that object is magnified so that it appears bigger. And your comprehension of the detail of that object is increased. And that's kind of what it's like when we more thoroughly comprehend how much we owe to God's grace. God's grace doesn't change. It doesn't get any bigger, but it appears to grow in our perception. Then, of course, there's another way you can grow in grace. You can become more gracious to others. Scripture uses the word grace or gracious in reference to preferred behavioral characteristics. That is the way we speak to others and in the ways that we act. And as in all things, Jesus is our example. John 1, 14, we read, The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus was full of grace and truth. And although Jesus is the mediator of God's saving grace, I believe that here it's speaking of his demeanor towards others. His speech and actions were always gracious towards others. Unless, of course, you are a religious hypocrite, and then he would uh, take you down. How are we to be gracious? One way is found in Colossians 4-5. It says, walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time, and let your speech be always with grace. Let your speech be with grace. As though it were seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Think of grace or graciousness as the seasoning of our speech. You take a Take the grace shaker and sprinkle a little grace on the way you talk to other people. Don't be gruff. Don't be snippy. Don't be mean. <laughs> and here's mine. Don't be sar sarcastic. And we ask, is there room for change in your life in this area? Is there room for growth? And for growth and change or kind of interchangeable. Is there room for change in any of these areas, in your manner of speaking, the way you deal with others? Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good for the use of edifying. Why? That it may minister grace to the hearers. People pick up on graciousness. They pick up on kindness. They know when you're talking to them and not down to them. <laughs> well, what other ways can we be gracious? One way I can think of is by not telling people all of the dirt that we happen to know about others. I don't know what it is about us folks that our natural instinct is that we always seem to want to put other people down. If we know something derogatory, something that's deprecating, something that's insulting or belittling about some someone. We see them do something and we just can't wait to tell somebody how nasty it was. Why is it our impulse to make that information public knowledge? If we're people of the good news, we should not be sharing everyone's vulnerable information. Is this a point of growth? point of change that we could implement to grow in grace. I've had several instances recently where I had somebody say something about someone else, and I really questioned it at first. I could that really be true? And then I saw that person do the same thing myself. And I thought, you know, I could confirm that, or I can just keep that to myself. Why do I need to tell uh, anybody about that? All it will do is lower their opinion and make that person sort of a laughing stock. And there's no reason for me to do that. So 
in some way, I think in that experience, I grew because I kept my mouth shut and I didn't blab it and I didn't repeat it and I didn't gossip it. Growing in grace. Proverbs 11, 13 says, a talebearer reveals secrets. And this verse has, has come to me a lot lately. He that is of a faithful spirit conceals the matter. So it's a cover-up in the right sense of the word. You know, we don't, we don't expose people. We cover for them when we have opportunity. And let's be honest. Isn't this an area where we could all use a, a little bit of restraint? Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes. 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 Okay. What if God went around blabbing all of your faults and all your deficiencies? How would you like that? If God went around spilling all the dirt he knows about you, on the evening news. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That'd be tough. What if God knew, what if God told people all the stuff that you're thinking about, all the things that you do when no one is looking? I would say it's kind of gracious of him not to do that. Oh. How would you like it if God did that? Anybody? <laughs> So the next time you're about to pass on some delicious little tidbit of gossip, think about God's restraint in doing the, in regard to doing the same with your faults and failures and make the change. Grow in grace. Well, here's another one that features the example of Jesus in manifesting grace, and it's an area where we can grow. And I'm just going to briefly mention this one. I won't expound at length because of time considerations. But in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, it says this. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty you might become rich. So grace, graciousness, in this example of Jesus, is giving of oneself to meet the needs of others. Giving, I think, not only of our person, but of our stuff. Things that we can do to help meet the needs of other people. We should have our eyes open and our ears open, looking for opportunities to be gracious in that way to meet the needs of others. And another aspect of grace we want to consider is grace as God's enabling for our own lack of strength or ability. Grace as God's enabling power for us that compensates and overcomes for our own lack of strength or ability. In James 4, 6 and 7, it says, He gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So grace is an essential element in overcoming the wiles of our sworn enemy, the devil. You can grow. You can change in your capacity and your willingness to appropriate God's grace for whatever your trials, your temptations, whatever your weaknesses may be. And let's be honest, folks, we all got them. And this is a different representation of God's grace that speaks to his enabling power to make you an overcomer in your life. So I'm going to ask a real obvious question. Are you struggling with a particular sin? Ha, I'm going to bet the answer is yes. Does it have you by the throat? And is it choking the spiritual vitality out of you? And it's easy to say, 
oh well, we all have our struggles. And I've met a lot of people recently out here who are willing to do just that. They throw up their hands and concede victory to some sin in their lives. Uh, I don't know why, but out here I've found that profanity doesn't seem to carry the same weight with Christians that I'm used to seeing it carry. And people just throw stuff around like, like you wouldn't believe when you, when you mention it uh, to someone they say, oh, well, we all have our weaknesses, don't we? And of course, no sermon would be complete without some sort of classic rock reference, you know that. But it kind of reminds me of the lyrics to a Fleetwood Mac song, the song's entitled, Oh Well. And here it goes. When I talked to God, I knew he'd understand. He said, stick by me. I'll be your guiding hand. But don't ask me what to think of you. I might not give the answer that you want me to. To which the song concludes after a few guitar riffs, it says, oh well. <laughs> oh well. In other words, if God doesn't like me the way I am, I... What can I do about that? I guess that's just the way it is. Oh, well. The sin that we don't overcome in our lives is often the sin that we don't want to overcome. The one that we've grown comfortable with, and perhaps the sin that we love. And we need to stop making excuses for our sin and appropriating the grace of God to put those things to the sidelines in our life. There are many reasons why people fail to rid their lives of sins and habits that are grievous to God. But the power of God on his part to enable him to do so is not one of those reasons. Isn't it amazing that as Christians, we believe that God, by his word, called the worlds into existence. Man, I can't call a grain of sand into existence. But everything, everything that we see around us, the trees, the mountains, everything, all the stuff that things are made out of, God called them into existence. We believe that he formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into him the breath of life. We believe that he parted the waters of the Red Sea and led his people out of Egypt. We believe he enabled a shepherd boy to slay a 10-foot tall giant with only a sling. We believe that Jesus healed the sick, that he raised the dead, and was himself resurrected following a brutal public execution. Yes, God has all this power and then some. In Philippians 3, speaking of Jesus, it says he will change our vile body so it will be like his own glorious body according to the working whereby he is able to what? Subdue all things unto himself. You hear that? Jesus is able to subdue all things unto himself. And he will. So what is it that you can't allow his power and his grace to overcome and subdue in your life? Yes, we all have weaknesses. And growth would require a change in our perspective towards sin. So I ask you, if the entire created universe is going to be subjected to the will and to the authority of Christ, doesn't it make good sense that as his children, our lives should reflect that same subjection even now? So let's all determine to grow in the many facets of God's grace. It truly is amazing. Well, I don't know how we are for time. How are we for time? Do I have a few minutes? Uh -huh. Yes. Yes. I want to, when I moved out here, 
Carl told me that uh, Ethan missed my preaching. He liked my stories. <laughs> <laughs> and I never thought that much about it. Yeah, I do have a lot of stories. And I don't know. I like to share experiences that I have had. And I had a one of the most profound experiences I have had right in my driveway at my house. How many of you know what this thing is? Anybody know what this is? Okay, I'll show you the rest of it. It's got a piece of uh, cable attached to it with a little loop on the end. Anybody know what it is? This thing is a part of a breakaway switch from a trailer. <laughs> and what happens is uh, the trailer has brakes and it has a battery and it has this little switch. So if the trailer becomes unhitched from the vehicle, this thing pulls out and it applies the brakes. Well, this cable had rusted through after sitting in a parking lot of Little Grove Bible Church for 10 years and sitting in, in the woods at my house for three year, a couple years. And I needed to put a new cable on it. And so I went to Tractor Supply and I bought the cable and I bought the little, little <coughs> things that you uh, hammer together on the cable to keep it from coming apart. And uh, I'm working on this thing in my driveway and I hadn't put the new cable on yet, and I had this black part, and then I couldn't find it. And I looked, and I don't know whether you remember that black trailer that used to sit in the parking lot, but it has a wooden deck, and there are spaces between the boards. And so I looked in between all those boards and ran a screwdriver in there to make sure it wasn't in there, and I you know what it's like when you misplace something and you can't find it? It drives you crazy. And I looked under the trailer. I got down on my hands and knees and crawled around, brushed the dirt, looked back and forth underneath the tongue of the trailer, everywhere. I could not find it. And I thought, well, maybe I left it in the garage. So I started to walk into the garage and I hear, as it were, a voice. You know what it's like when God's talking to you. You don't hear the voice, but you, the words form in your mind. And it said, do you believe that I'm able to help you find that? <laughs> I said, yes, absolutely. 100% God, I believe that you're able to help me find that. I walked into the garage, looked around. It wasn't there. I walked out of the garage. The trailer was about, oh, probably 20 feet from the door where I walked out. And as I walked out that door, my eyes went to the ground. And I'm telling you, this thing was laying there right on the ground underneath the tongue of that trailer in plain sight. And it absolutely floored me. The... <laughs> It was a supernatural moment. It was like the presence of God was there in a, in a way that we don't It was like God did something for me.
just disconnected. Technology's great, and uh, <laughs> when it works, this is not an average thing. Next week, so it's like a cliffhanger. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have to hear the great story. <laughs> <laughs> we have to the story as the introduction to the following. Do we want to leave the? Uh, yeah, I think we can probably yeah. turn that oh. off. Right? Terry's gonna. Mm -hmm. Oh, the last stream. I was thinking. I don't know. It might be better to do this course kind of together yeah. because we don't have anyone actually prepared like individual questions. But it'd be nice to take some time. And this is a time free, you know, if people need to run, you're welcome to.